Okay, welcome to the 10th webinar in the COVID-19 Ask the Experts webinar series. This webinar will address a specific process for the pandemic's impact on academic instruction and student progress. This webinar uh, is intended to provide an overview of academic issues to consider during the pandemic. It will also launch for us a special series that's more in depth on webinars that have to do with um, academic issues for, uh, and working with kids. Um, that webinar series will be only available to NAS members and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the, later in the broadcast. Uh, I am Stacy Kalamir Skalski and I am NAS Director of Professional Policy and Practice and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Okay, the Ask the Experts webinar series is a collection of recorded webinars that we post to the NASP website. They are designed to offer support to school psychologists and interns and practicum students, anybody working in the field of school psychology as they navigate the delivery of school psych services during the pandemic. Uh, each webinar is free and open to the public. Uh, at the conclusion of each of the webinars, a discussion thread will be opened on the NAS member exchange, and if you are a NAS member, you can join in to the discussions there. Uh, that's a great place to post any questions that you have, uh, or if you want to just make comments in relation to the kinds of things that you heard about that you'd like to connect with and share with others. That's a good place to do it. Uh, for each webinar, we will address critical questions emerging as a result of the need to provide telehealth services in schools and we will provide advice and guidance uh, from uh, experts in our field as well as offering some strategies and resources for addressing professional practice issues. So today we have four experts joining us um, to talk a little bit about uh, academic instruction and student progress. I think you'll recognize many of these great names. Uh, first we have Matt Burns. Uh, Dr. Matt Burns is a professor, professor of special education at the University of Missouri, and he's also the director of the Center for Collaborative Solutions for Kids, Practice, and Policy. He's published over 175 articles and book chapters in national publications and has co-authored or co-edited 14 books. He is also the past editor of the School Psych Review and a past editor of Assessment for Effective Intervention. Dr. Burns is one of the leading researchers regarding the use of assessment data to determine individual or small group interventions, and he's published extensively on response to intervention, academic interventions, and facilitating problem-solving teams. In addition, Dr. Burns was also a practicing school psychologist and special ed administrator before becoming an academic, and he served on the faculty of the University of Minnesota for 10 years and at Central, Uni uh, Central Michigan University for five years. So welcome, Matt. Our second expert today is Dr. Joe Kovaleski. Uh, Dr. Joe is Professor of Emeritus of Educational and School Psychology at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where he was the director of the, uh, the doctoral program in school psychology from 2003 to 2017. He now consults with school districts and state departments of education. Uh, Dr. Kovaleski directed Pennsylvania's Instructional Support Team Project and served as a university consultant for Pennsylvania's multi-tiered system of support initiatives. He has published numerous articles and book chapters on response to intervention and database decision making. Welcome to Joe. Thirdly, we have Dr. Timothy Rungi. Um, Tim is a professor in the Department of Educational and School Psychology at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Prior to taking the faculty position at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Rungi served as an educational consultant for the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network, known as PATN. PATN is a division of the Pennsylvania Department of Education, the Bureau of Special Education. During his work at PATN, or in his work at PATN, um, he was the regional coordinator of the school-wide positive behavior support initiative, and he assisted a number of schools with behavioral support, literacy instruction, consultation, implementation of MTSI, MTSS and RTI, and school improvement. Prior to working at PATN, Dr. Rengi worked as a school psychologist and coordinator of special ed services in rural central Pennsylvania. Welcome, Tim. And lastly, we have uh, Dr. Amanda Vanderhayden. 
Amanda is a private consultant, researcher, national trainer, and founder of Spring Math, a web-based comprehensive math RTI system. She's the president of Education Research and Consulting, Inc. in Fairhope, Alabama, and has worked in a number of school districts nationally and internationally. Dr. Van der Hayden has developed models of MTSS and RTI, academic screening, and class-wide interventions. She frequently provides policy advice and serves on a number of boards in education and psychology. Dr. Vander Hayden has published more than 95 scholarly articles and chapters, seven books, and has given keynote addresses to state school psych associations, state departments of education in 31 states, and also in the country of Singapore. Thank you all for participating and sharing your expertise in this webinar today. So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna ask Joe and Matt to um, answer these first questions for us. Uh, the first question for us. So Joe and Matt, how do you see the role of school psychologists changing, if at all, in supporting academic instruction during and after long-term school closures? And let's start with Joe. Okay, thanks, Stacy. Um, it would be nice to think that all school psychologists have a wonderful expanded role and they're doing all kind of wonderful things we've all been trained to do. But uh, I know that in many places, that's not the way it is. So um, the, the break in action here really provides an opportunity for many school psychologists who have a chance here, I think, to step forward and kind of um, show other areas that uh, they might be helpful with. First, one thing that's going to happen, which we'll talk about later in depth, um, is that we have to figure out where kids are in terms of academically, behaviorally, emotionally after a long break. Uh, there's going to be impact on all those areas uh, for our kids. And uh, school psychologists certainly can be there to, to be involved in training uh, and, more importantly, uh, to help as we get data on kids uh, as they're coming back to really understand what the data mean, not only for individual kids, but for, for groups in general. We're, I don't think we have any idea um, nationwide where kids are in terms of their academic skills um, after this break. And um, there's probably as many different scenarios we can paint today <clears throat> as there are kids in schools and so forth. So uh, we're, we're really gonna have to get a handle on that and school psychologists I think really can be helpful with that. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen, and again, I think we'll talk about this later, is we're going to have to kind of fill some gaps uh, and get um, get kids caught up. And one thing I see school psychologists potentially doing is uh, you hear about the, the all hands on deck situations where everybody's got to just pitch in. So uh, I, I can see school psychologists pitching in with academic intervention, uh, doing some teaching, doing some inter intervention work. Uh, and um, because we're going to really need to get all hands on deck to help. And then there are some kids that I think that are going to have some emotional issues coming uh, to school. Um, kids that start out with some emotional concerns or even those that kind of come over the, the intervening time. School psychologists, again, in terms of counseling, crisis intervention, uh, those effective areas, uh, you can see us really having an opportunity here to step forward. And I think that stepping forward is going to be an important thing. Great. Matt, what would you add to that? Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for including me in this. Thanks for doing this webinar. Um, I, I have a couple of things just to quickly add uh, to Joe's great comments. Uh, I think it's best practice is going to be critically important right now. Yeah, we're going to have to get back to an ecological approach. Um, Right now, uh, I don't know how any child, for example, could be identified with a learning disability because I don't know how you rule out all the, the necessary rules of instruction right now. So we have to really push for a more preventative model while also you know, treat, think, treating the whole world as, as crisis. So I, I would encourage school psychologists to move away from child-centered deficit explanations of problems and start looking at the whole system, the whole environment. It means if it's a behavior difficulty, looking at reading uh, problems. If it's a reading difficulty, looking at attendance and, and things like that. You gotta look at the whole kid to figure out what's going on uh, in order to be, to, to take a truly preventative approach and start diving in. class intervention, targeting intervention, really, really important. And we'll talk more detail about that in, in, later. 
All right. I can't agree with you more. Um, I think the whole child approach has certainly been a primary focus of the work of school psychologists for years, and I don't know if there's ever been a time where it's more critical to keep in mind uh, in our day-to-day -day activities. Um, as we are planning, um, or as we've been planning these Ask the Experts webinars, uh, we did decide that we wanted to do a series of webinars that were specific to the mental health um, and emotional considerations of kids, as well as uh, the academic needs of kids. And um, this webinar series that we're doing today and the ones that will kick off subsequently, we would like to kind of keep our focus just on academics. We know that there's a lot going on with the emotional aspects. And so um, just letting our listeners know then there will be a series of webinars that parallel this that will focus on um, emotional and mental health issues. Uh, so again, for today, let's just try and focus as much as we can on um, issues related to academics. Um, so with that in mind, then for our second question, um, what are the most important aspects that we need to consider about the learner today uh, in the fall when schools resume, and how should school psychologists be preparing for those scenarios? And um, let's start with Amanda, and then we'll have Tim um, follow her in responding to this one. Amanda? Yeah, the, the key advice I can offer here is that if you figure that most schools will, will have been closed for eight to 10 weeks, and there are typically about 36 weeks in the school year, then we can assume going in that a best case scenario is that children have had less than what they would have gotten in a face-to-face -face instructional interaction. Um, they're gonna be coming in having gotten about a 75% dose of the prior year's instruction. So we know immediately before we begin the intervention, that there are really important skill gaps that we can assume. And actually, if we try to measure these with um, screenings, we can probably make bad decisions and make inaccurate decisions. Um, and we will make better decisions if we assume from the get-go that kids have these gaps. They're, they're pretty knowable. So we, have, we can look to the um, local standards and state standards for performance. We can sort of map it out and say, okay, kids did not get the last 25% of the uh, learning standards in reading, language arts, and mathematics, for example, and we can begin to think about how we can backfill some of those deficits. The great news is, because screening is not gonna function well in an environment where we have these high base rates of risk, which I think we'll talk about in more depth as we go, um, we can actually use our intervention strategy, which is a, a core, class-wide supplementation, so it's a class-wide intervention is what we're gonna recommend through this series. And we can then harvest the information that we get from doing that intervention to make really accurate decisions about which children really do need more intensive intervention. And then we can use those data to inform eligibility decisions. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, Tim, can you add to that a little bit? Sure, absolutely, and again, thank you for this opportunity. Consistent with what, with what Joe and Matt and Amanda have already said, I would just add that I think we really need to be heavily involved in the instructional design and delivery element of education. And, you know, consistent with what Matt said just a few moments ago, you know, this matter of whether kids have a disability largely should be put off the table, at least temporarily. That means school psychologists have a wonderful opportunity to really support the instructional design and delivery uh, when students return whether that's face-to-face -face or virtual or in a hybrid format, we really need to be supportive of all educators in using the data that are available to target specific instruction and instructional practices and evidence-based uh, instructional strategy for all kids. And so I think that we bring to the table a wealth of information about data, specific screening and progress monitoring data with a really heavy emphasis on progress monitoring of students' performance once they return, and use those data in conjunction with the educators with whom we work to really focus on what are the key instructional targets and what are the evidence-based instructional practices that we can facilitate with teachers so that students can continue to progress um, once they return to school. And again, consistent with uh, something that was said earlier, it's really gonna be a hands-on approach with, in which all school staff, whether it's school psychologists, school counselors, social workers, paraeducators, really need to step up. And this is a wonderful opportunity for those support personnel 
to really provide instructional support, not only to kids, but also consultation support to the teachers that are working with students. Great. You know, um, all of you have mentioned the importance of not just uh, doing our work sort of as we normally do, but really thinking about how to um, take our work and focus more on the learner and um, really the types of supports and structures that need to be present in the classrooms. Um, with that in mind, let's look at our next question, which really is um, focusing more on that process uh, that we use in schools to identify kids who are struggling in the classrooms. Um, so for this question, when considering our child find obligations and a school's problem solving process, such as MTSS or RTI, child study, whatever the school may call it, um, how do the extended school closures actually impact our process for addressing academic concerns and the needs of students? And let's start with Amanda and have her answer that first um, and then follow up with Joe. Yeah, regardless of the approach that you choose, if you're looking at an eligibility evaluation for SLD, you have always, for many iterations, been required to rule out lack of instruction as an alternative explanation for unexpected underachievement. This is not a new requirement, and this matters if you're using RTI to satisfy some of your criteria for decision making here, but if you're using a different approach, um, uh, cognitive assessment to determine eligibility for SLD, for example, you um, still have to rule out lack of adequate instruction. So in this case, we actually have evidence. We have really important evidence that says instruction has been compromised. What children have experienced during the 25% of the year that they were not in school will be highly variable across uh, settings and also could be highly variable even within the same school for different children. So some children may have had a really rich experience with close adult supervision in their home, perhaps from a parent who loves to teach reading and has a background. We've got professors' kids at home who, who are getting instruction from some of the best reading researchers in the field. They've had good instruction, but then there are other parents maybe who have had to go to work and children have been left at home unsupervised. And in fact, the LA Times reported a piece that um, one third of their high school students in LA Unified had not had a daily check-in with teachers since the closure of school. And they reported this at the end of March. So their experience has been highly variable. So we cannot assume, and in fact, we have evidence that says that instruction cannot be ruled out. But here's the great news about that. If you exert some control around that independent variable, meaning you use a tactic like class-wide intervention deployed with fidelity, which we're gonna teach you how to do in these webinars, I hope that that is a key takeaway then you can still fairly rapidly make some decisions about who needs more intensive intervention and who needs um, potentially an eligibility evaluation. And you will have collected really good data in the process that you can use within your eligibility evaluation to make a really great, great and defensible and ethical decision about, about which students should receive special education. Um, that's, that's excellent uh, feedback. Uh, Jill, what would you add to that? Make sure you unmute too, Joe. We can't hear you. I'm kind of worried about both over-identification of kids with learning disabilities and under-identification. Um, mostly over-identification because I think what, first of all, I think we have to be very concerned and sensitive to what parents have been going through these past number of months. There's a lot of stress out there and parents worry all the time and about all kinds of things. And one of the things I think parents who saw their kids having trouble in school before this started and now see their kids kind of falling off the table, they're going to be concerned about maybe my child has a learning disability and they're not going to be very patient about us wanting to get back into interventions, which is exactly what we should do as soon as we can. So we're going to have we're going to have that kind of push. The other issue, the the uh, under identification, um, <clears throat> is is when we have kids that may indeed have been kind of at the end of the three tiers before we we ended, and all of a sudden we're going to want kids back in interventions. Again, a good idea. But we want to be careful about child find issues if we do have a history of failure that goes way beyond the break. 
the other really big issue I think with with looking at the, these issues is we're going to really have differences in what kids have gone through during the break based on socioeconomic status. Um, I heard a story the other day about a high school student that was late with a paper because she was writing her paper in the parking lot of Starbucks uh, with her iPhone and with her thumbs. So a very different scenario than, than our, our, our picture of a, a child who's at home with good bandwidth online with an ice computer. So, so th those issues that, that we have about where kids were and what happened during that time uh, is, is really kind of critical. Um, I really think Amanda has hit it. Some kids are going to remarkably be doing okay because their parents have been, have been reading books about how to teach reading and, and looking at the science of reading. And other kids, their parents have, have just been just getting life together and, and just surviving during this time. And that difference, which is always there for us, is just going to be exacerbated. So I think we have to be really sensitive to those things. I think um, what you're saying, I think, is really important um, that we really just need to take the time, be patient, and really start to clearly isolate the impact of the destruction or uh, disruption in instruction that we've had and how that's impacting kids' learning. Uh, it seems super important. Um, let's think about then, really, if we um, are going to go about this and, and really look at ways to start to identify the needs of kids. Um, I know we need to start thinking about screening. So let's look at uh, question four, and I'm going to ask Amanda if she'll answer this. Uh, what should be the focus of academic screening efforts now and when school resumes in the fall? And uh, what screening activities do you think school psychologists should be engaged in over the summer to get ready for that? Yeah, I have some really specific recommendations about screening, and of course, I'm very excited to talk about screening because I do think we have learned so much in from research over the last decade that we can operate so much um, smarter with regard to academic screening. Um, and I just want to make a little touch back to the last question and say that I think it's a really important role for school psychologists to be able to um, sort of be a voice of reason around you know, providing a child with increasingly intensive interventions is not a hands-off waiting period. And, but parents may feel that way. So parents may not understand what's actually involved when we talk about tier two and tier three intervention or even class-wide intervention for that matter, which is a very powerful tool. And they may believe that that's all just something we've got to check the box and get through so we can make this child eligible and then I can finally get some help for my student. But you know, the reality is, and we know this in our field, but we need to tell the story better um, and have the credibility and the rapport with the folks that we're working with and partnering with to benefit children and families, that such that they can believe that this is really true because it is, that in many cases, what children receive in the name of tier three intervention is more intensive than what they will receive when they uh, are made eligible for special education. That's the reality of um, the world that we live in. And so if, if nothing else, it's a way to allay parent concerns that there needs to be this rush, this rush to make children eligible. Really effective intervention produces benefit for students by definition. That's how we determine what an effective intervention is. And so it's not a hands-off waiting period it will benefit uh, students. And then this segues really nicely into what I want to talk about with screening, and I'm super excited to do that webinar for, for NASP because one of the things that I want to help school, my school psych data wonk uh, analytical thinker folks to do is unpack why the base rates are the problem here. So we're going to come in with a high base rate of risk. When you have a high base rate of risk, your probability of being wrong in saying that a child does not need intervention or does not potentially need an eligibility evaluation or even a determination um, goes up. So just by chance alone, you're more likely to be wrong. And the way you contend and make your screening process more accurate is you have to directly address the base rate. So what I have um, done in my research over the years and in my practice uh, is introduce intervention trials 
usually in the form of class-wide intervention because it's super efficient. You can touch all children for the same investment of 12 minutes of time each day. Most children benefit, so um, the lowest performing students in the class grow, the highest performing students in the class grow, and what happens is over using those data, so how children grow relative to each other, given this sort of simple but very powerful standard protocol intervention makes it really apparent to everybody involved in about 10 to 15 sessions. So within two to three weeks, you can begin to make decisions about which children need more intensive intervention and perhaps additional collected data to um, inform whether or not you want to have an, an eligibility evaluation. So in my session, I'm going to show you with data and take that apart and then make really targeted recommendations about how to harvest your class-wide intervention data as a second screening gate so that you can improve your accuracy. Okay, let's take a look now at each area of core instruction um, that's important to kids in school. Um, let's, let, what I'd like to do is um, just ask then, what are the key considerations for academic instruction and intervention in reading, in writing and math for a virtual or hybrid uh, type of learning environment, whatever the kids are coming back into. Um, and where should school psychologists focus their efforts when working with teachers? And let's start with Matt, and you can, Matt, tell us just a little bit about um, this in regards to reading, that would be helpful. Sure, um, mostly what I talk about though, I'll try and focus on reading, but I'm willing to bet will apply to other areas as well. So. Seems like during the during the pandemic and the school work from home, there have been the, the packets. And the packets have been for reading, extension, application, comprehension focused. So I really think it's gonna be important to, to stick with the science of reading, as as others have said in the fall, and and to go back to some more basic skills. Um, because I my sense is, and I, I don't don't base this on I base this on nothing except my own experience with my own kids and, and what I've seen is um they're, they're, the holes are going to be in those areas, those basic skills. And when we think about intervention, what was a good tier two intervention last year for second grade might not be a good one this year. We're really gonna have to focus on what individual kids' needs are. So when you're looking at assessing children to see what type of intervention they need, especially for reading, you're gonna, you may have to go back to prerequisite skills that are taught in grades much earlier than you've done previously. And you may have to focus the intervention more on something even more fun, uh, foundational and fundamental than you have in the past. So I have a hunch in the fall, well, there's, of course, Amanda's already mentioned classified intervention. I would start, I, I, I don't know if you explicitly said this, Amanda, uh, I might have missed it, and I'm sure you will at some point. I would almost hold off on screening completely until we do classified intervention in the fall. This is just assume all kids come in with risk. So I would start with classified intervention right away and then start tier two intervention after those class by interventions happen, it makes sure the tier two interventions are highly focused on foundational skills for each individual kid. Okay, Tim, uh, can you address writing for us a little bit? Absolutely, and I, I believe what I'm about to say is gonna be consistent with, Matt, with what Matt just said, in that we have to focus on the science of literacy instruction, which is of course inclusive of writing. We need to remind educators about the direct linkages between reading and writing, and that learners often develop these skills concurrently. And we also know that the science is clearly in, indicative of high quality instruction in literacy and intervention in reading and writing often has positive collateral effects on writing skill acquisition. So, so we know they're absolutely related. Therefore, school psychologists absolutely must be knowledgeable about what are the evidence-based practices for literacy instruction for all kids. And certainly what are some of those interventions that will be appropriate at the advanced tiers. We all know that prior to COVID-19, the, the data clearly indicated that U.S. students were underperforming in writing with approximately only 25% of 8th and 12th graders reading, or excuse me, achieving proficiency in writing. So clearly the need was already there, and now it's just, of course, been exacerbated by COVID. Therefore, we, we know that we have to focus on evidence-based literacy instruction for both reading and writing, and we need those assessment data, particularly progress monitoring data, once we've installed class-wide in, interventions. And again, consistent with what Matt and Amanda have previously said, we need to focus initially in the fall on class-wide interventions to support literacy instruction development, both reading and writing. 
And then once we've installed those practices, then we can begin to collect data to help inform future instruction and intervention. And what better professional to be able to facilitate the data collection and problem solving process than school psychologists? So I think those are absolutely critical ways in which we as school psychologists can support the development of literacy, including writing, once the fall, uh, the fall school year begins. Excellent. Amanda, what would you add in regards to math? Yeah, okay, I love this question because just sort of taking a 40,000 foot view for a second, we had, as, as Tim said, we had a terrible problem already in this country where we have so much about instruction that is political and it is driven by philosophy. And that is a luxury that we really cannot afford. We need to be much more efficient about our ability to help attain and repair skill gaps and help children have better success in schools. And the way that we do that, of course, is to help systems adopt practices that have been shown to work through good empirical investigation. And one of the things that research has taught us in the world of um, MTSS and Joe and Tim and I have been writing about this a lot is that there are better ways to intensify instruction than what we used to understand. So what we used to think is that we just could, could instruct for a longer duration, um, more minutes in the day, and that that would in, reflect a greater intensification of instruction. And what we now know is we can be uh, much more uh, surgically precise than that. And so intensification has to do with uh, alignment of instructional content and learner proficiency, which I would say we do through the instructional hierarchy. And that means that you figure out, like Matt talked about, which prerequisite skills are lacking. Do they need acquisition type support or fluency building support or generalization type support? And then you make sure that what you are offering is in alignment with that need. And that means, so tier two groupings, for example, one of the things I would recommend right away is that we do that better. We don't do that well in the world of MTSS already. What, why? We put kids into groups based on beginning of the year assessment and there they, they live, often for the rest of the year. Um, and that is not best practice. That is not intensified instruction as we now understand it from research. Those groupings need to be more dynamic, meaning as children grow at different paces, which they will, they need to be able to change to a grouping for which the content is now a better alignment with what their proficiency is and, or their learning needs are. Um, we need weekly progress monitoring of any intervention that is being implemented, and we need really um, sophisticated implementation support for implementation and instruction in schools. That, that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like the important messages behind what all three of you are sharing are that we need to begin with classroom intervention and really assess um, what the kids' basic prerequisite skills are and how they're doing, and make sure that we use evidence-based instructional methodologies in that process, and then really think about how kids um, are grouped in terms of their actual abilities and the progress that they are making um, before we embark on any other kind of deeper exploration around individuals um, and what, what their uh, particular um, disability possibilities might be. Uh, let's keep going then and think about next then, what are some academic considerations that school psychologists should keep in mind when conducting special education evaluations during and after long-term closures, thinking about as they take these next steps once we've gotten really a feel for where kids are? Um, how should our practices be um, be adjusted. And let's uh, ask Matt to start answering that, and then we'll look to Joe. Great, thank you. So I have a few specific recommendations um, that focus on, you said the academic things, I'm, I'm gonna focus more on uh, norms and practices along, along those lines. So the NASP and APA both have some great documents on their websites to help guide some of these conversations. And APA made some specific recommendations about testing for telehealth. And they said that you've got to, you have to think critically about subtest and subtest substitution and only focus on the full scale measures right now for these you know multi uh, trait uh, measures. Um, I, I'm gonna they say that's because you're, if you're doing telehealth, you're changing a telehealth assessment, you're changing the administration procedure under which it was normed. 
yes, of course, it makes perfect sense. But even if you're doing a face-to-face -face assessment in the fall, you're going to affect the norms, I would argue, because, because the, the, the situation is different than an eight-year-old you know, two years ago when, they were, when the norm was created. So because of that, we're going to have to be careful about any subtest interpretation. Uh, which and um, also they recommended using wider confidence intervals and in making decisions, which I thought was a really good idea as well. So we, because of these things, um, the NASA has on their website some information from OSEP that talks about when you're doing an evaluation, really think what measures are needed for this kid. And if you don't, OSEP has said many times, you don't have to do an IQ test to identify a child with a learning disability. You don't have to do an IQ test to identify emotional behavior disorder, et cetera. So really think critically and hard about what measures are needed. And if they're not needed, don't use them. You, if the kids, if this is a three, you know, the third three-year reeval for a kid, you probably don't need to give them another IQ test, for example. So I really have to come back to think around those things about what tests are needed, how do we do those effectively, and, and remember that you cannot delay an evaluation because to complete an RTI process. You can because the kid missed school because of the, because of the pandemic, yes. So if you need more time to collect intervention work, and I would argue if, if you picked up, if even if the kid was getting intervention in the fall, right away we do class by intervention and use, at least use two weeks worth of, of data there to help inform some of the decision-making. You know, at least your pre and post measure there or something to help, if, to help um, do some decision-making for, for even LD identification, even in a situation where, where you're not doing RTI uh, as your LD identification process. There is no way today that you can rule out inadequate instruction for any kid, as others have already said. So that's, in order to consider that, I want to see how the child responds to an intervention in which most of the class did quite well. So class for interventions, don't delay because, because you need to do RTI and, and really look at some of these skills, uh, uh, measures and what are needed, which means real quickly to, to school psychs, it might mean letting go of some of the practices you've done in the past, at least in the short term. You know, I know some of us believe that IQ tests help inform intervention. I would argue research has clearly shown that's not the case. But recent surveys have shown people are doing IQ tests in an RTI model, even though they're not required. I really encourage you, for at least for the next few weeks, to think critically about that. I mean, when, especially when kids come back in the first few weeks of school to months of school, to think really critically about that and think, is, can, can you let go of that? And can we, for efficiency, and to make sure we have a, a, a more, um, valid decision, can we take a slightly different approach? Okay. Joe, what would you add to that? Well, at the, at the risk of um, beating a dead horse here, um, we are very focused, I think, collectively among our panel here today on this issue of lack of instruction because it's just in our face. I mean, a, a lot of folks have had a hard time with that concept over the past uh, 15 years of RTI, but, but that is is really kind of very critical now. I and mean, you know, we just can't be about uh, documenting on lack of instruction, what the, doing an interview with the parent and what they did and so forth or what they didn't do during intervention. Because um, I had a professor many years ago that we, we all used to say all children can learn. And he used to always add, if they are carefully taught. And, um, you know, when we see kids that are in the tiered, in tiered interventions, what we know is they not only need a lot of instruction, they need very explicit instruction. And whatever they were getting at home, unless it's a very unusual situation, they weren't getting the kind of tier, um, explicit instruction that they would have been getting in the tiers. So by definition, there's a lack of instruction going on here. I want to pick up on something that uh, Amanda said a minute ago. Um, don't know if you caught it. Uh, she said weekly progress monitoring. A lot of folks, a lot of writing about uh, multi-tier systems of support, talk about progress monitoring at tier two, especially twice uh, twice a month. We've got to not only get kids in interventions quicker and more intensively uh, early, we've got to ramp up progress monitoring so that if we do have whatever factors there are that are moving interventions forward, whether it's time clocks that you're under uh, by, by state regulations, or whether it's parent pressure, whatever, we have to make sure we have a lot of data to make a good decision. Because for me, I think, uh, as Matt just mentioned, the best data I have about informing intervention and whether a child might have a learning disability is how far behind are they and are they catching up? Are they catching up and going to someplace meaningfully, uh, someplace meaningful 
within a reasonable amount of time. And the only way we're going to get that information is to do progress monitoring. Some people have not embraced progress monitoring as frequently as we are talking about here today. And I think this is a real opportunity again to get people not only doing it because of the, the problem at hand with the, with the, the COVID break, but, but also because this is good practice that we should be embracing on a general, general perspective. So, so here, here again is maybe an opportunity situation where things we do after the break become things that become more standard practice for us and are good um, procedures, period. All right, excellent, um, excellent uh, commentaries there. I mean, we know that educators are somewhat accustomed to managing summer learning loss when a new school year begins, um, but this concept of really looking at what that impact of lack of instruction might be is going to be really important. So what additional academic support may be needed to address learning loss in the unique context of an extended school closure? And maybe Amanda can tackle that for us. Well, one thing that is really truly a silver lining that I have been telling parents and telling myself, you know, the best quarter of the year to have lost is the one that we did. And the reason for that is we know growth, academic growth, is not linear over the course of, of a school year. In fact, we feel so strongly about that that we are now advising people in the RTI world that you really can only compare fall to winter trends against kids and then winter to spring uh, trends to, for decision making because a linear model is not appropriate. Even though we've done it for years, we need to revise that and update that practice. Um, and the reason for that, some people uh, hypothesize that c kids come in a little suppressed from a summer learning loss, which causes more growth to occur in the fall to winter semester relative to the winter to spring. And then the other hypothesis is that there's an awful lot of end of year rituals and end of year testing that actually competes very effectively and takes instructional time, which causes really and truly less learning to occur in the second half of the school year. But either way, we know it's not linear. So I don't know that school psychologists really are accustomed to thinking about summer learning loss and coming in with boosters. But I think now is a real opportunity to um, maybe start a practice habit that will benefit children in years to come, as, as Joe has said, because we should. We should be coming in in the fall with an anticipata uh, anticipation that children are um, going to need some booster, some review, some catch up. And the point that I would want to make to people is, well, first thing, you know, first, the silver lining is we lost the best quarter we could have because we lost the quarter in which the least amount of learning occurs. But there may be future shutdowns. We may have losses in the fall. And so we may need, need to become pretty nimble about how to help children restart. And it's just a good practice habit to assume that children do not need a waiting period in which we sit back in a hands-off way and wait for general education to take hold and then start to make decisions with the data. That is inefficient, and it's going to be highly variable across contexts, very dependent upon a teacher's capacity to provide the right boosters for children. So what a wonderful skill set for, for um, school psychologists to exercise, to be able to come in as, as that right hand instructional ally, all hands on deck support with the teacher to help the teacher institute booster sessions right away. And you, again, I think the way we're gonna teach in this series to do it, why? Because we we all do it in our practice and in our research because it is so efficient. A 12 to 15 minute, class-wide intervention using the class-wide peer tutoring format, such as the PAL system, the press reading model, my work in math, class-wide math intervention, um, that's the most efficient way to, to do it. Excellent. Uh, you reminded me that for each of the kids, we really have to always attend to the many phases of the school year and also uh, how those impact them at both academically and personally. So thinking then um, as our last question, I just want to kind of get to some of those more personal issues that impact kids. So what are the most critical equity issues that are important to address in virtual learning, um, specifically around academics, and how can the school psychologist help respond to these? And, and Tim, maybe you could tackle this for us to start with and then let Amanda wrap up for us. 
Tim? Absolutely. And of course, we all appreciate and understand that equity issues are only magnified or intensified given the COVID pandemic. As we've all said previously in this webinar, schools must acknowledge that the likely reality that achievement gaps are expanding during the spring's considerable disruption, or even for some schools, there has been no instruction going on from the time schools close until the end of the academic year. And as we've also all said, the initial hypothesis for these expanded gaps in achievement, which result in inequities, should be a focus, primary focus on the lack of instruction and, and not necessarily a, a consideration of a disability unless for what others have previously said, there was already some mounting or building evidence prior to the disruption of instruction. I think actually there are two primary, at least two primary things that school psychologists can do to support planning and delivering virtual instruction if it happens to be the case this fall. I think first is we can help administrators assess and assist with access to virtual learning technologies for all of our families, whether this be through surveying via multimodalities to find out what do parents and families need to support their students' virtual learning come the fall or even a hybrid model. What do they need and how can we tap into community resources, statewide or national resources to, to build up those technologies and accessibility to those, to those technologies for our learners because that's can be critical. But the good news is, is we've got a summer break here where many school psychologists who are practitioners are quite honestly working a few extra days if not many days over the summer by contract they can assist in helping to get ready for a delivery of virtual or a hybrid approach come the fall. And I think we as school psychologists can work with administrators to reach out to the communities to help families get the materials, the resources that they might need and be very creative in problem solving. Again, recognizing in some of our communities, Wi-Fi is not readily available or it's intermittent at best. So what can we do as a school community to help improve accessibility. So I think that's the first thing school psychologists can do, and we have this summer to prepare for that. The second one, which we also do have time to prepare for, would be school psychologists collaborating with educators to help them develop instructionally relevant, evidence-based lessons that can be delivered in a non-traditional format. Let's be honest, most teachers during this break had less than a week or two to get ready to deliver some sort of online instruction and they were never trained to do that in the first place. And they've quite honestly been doing the best they can. And I applaud all of them for everything that they have done. But now we've got some time in the summer to actually purposefully and meaningfully plan around that. And what better resource than to tap into your school psychologists who have expertise in instructional design, instructional delivery, and the learning process in general to help educators better prepare for an online virtual or a hybrid approach come the fall. Excellent. Um, Amanda, what would you add to that? Okay, I love everything you said about access. Absolutely. And I, I know early on I read about a district that was parking school buses strategically in various um, parts of a county so that children could have access to Wi-Fi. But really, if I just tell you what I really believe or wish for in my heart of hearts is that the um, teachers can take responsibility for student learning in classrooms. Because um, if we are highly efficient and we are really focused on evidence-based interventions and instructional tactics in classrooms, then you know I used to have this professor, um, who some of you know, George Knoll, and he used to say, you know, give me the kid and half the time and I'll get twice the growth. And that's because he really truly understands the science of instructional design and how powerful it can be. There's a school in um, Seattle called Morningside Academy that's been around for a long time. And in fact, they're so confident in the science of, of instruction that they have offered since 1981, that two years of growth for one year of instruction or your money back. And I asked Kent Johnson, who was their director one time, how, many time, how much money have you given back over the years? And he said fewer than 1% of students have ever received uh, a refund. That is truly the promise of really effective instruction. And sometimes we can be a little uh, soft and lackadaisical and understand the school as an environment that accomplishes a lot more than just learning. And it, that's true, it does. As we've learned with this experience, right? We're worried about children being able to eat, to be safe, to be supervised. There are all kinds of things that the school provides for a child. But one of those things is really effective instruction. And I think what I would say to teachers is, 
you have to anticipate that your available instructional time and access to a student might be lesser than what you've had in the past. And so therefore you have to be more, you have to be more surgically precise, more effective. That means more committed to the science of instruction. If you don't know it, you, you know, you want to brush up on it and learn that science, follow the science of reading. We have a lot of soft practices out there in math, for example, that that actually detract from learning. And this is, is analogous to what the science of reading movement is demonstrating. But if we use evidence-based practices, we can get the growth that students need. So my hope is that children will be in school in some form or fashion. And even if it's a reduced schedule, if we are surgically precise in the, about the ways in which we deliver instruction, I think we can find a balance there that, that will work for students. The equity thing too is unpredictable. It's unlike other ways that maybe we traditionally have thought of learning gaps. There's, there are all kinds of ways in which children may be unevenly impacted by this event. So for example, even in you know, very um, financially well-off families, with lots of resources typically, you could have two parents who are working in healthcare and have not even been home, and children have been very stressed and unsupervised because the babysitter is afraid to come, so they're home alone. That could be going on. So it's not gonna be quite as predictable as we might think of where these gaps might be occurring. So we need to assume that all children are susceptible to these gaps, my, my take. Okay, um, I think, let's see, I wanna just make sure, uh, it sounds like, um, in this case, Joe, you maybe wanted to add something additional? Um. Well, I, I was just um, reflecting on the last couple comments by Amanda and Tim and kind of like um, new thought for me that, you know, I think a lot of people in our society are in denial about where we are, where we might be. And, you know, I'm kind of approaching this whole webinar and we're gonna be back in school in September. and Goodness knows if we're going to be back in school in September. Uh, you know, we may be back. We may be on some sort of model. We, you know, heard about some school districts starting in the morning, uh, having one group of kids in the morning and another group of kids in the afternoon. Uh, we might have another in various places break again in the fall. Uh, one of the things that is going to be hard for us, I think, to do that we're going to have to do is think out of the box on not where do we go back to, but where might schooling have to go given that this may be a multi-year problem, and what do we need to do to address those kind of issues? One of the things I've been thinking about as we've been going through this is, you know, you got a fourth grade teacher and you've got a kid, as Amanda said, who's missed 25% of last year's instruction. Does that fourth grade teacher know how to go back and teach those skills? I mean, that's not normally what I do as a fourth grade teacher. I don't teach those third grade stuff. And we have to, I guess, get much more in, uh, understanding of, of precursor skills, where kids might be or may not be. And again, thinking forward in, into environments that may just be really different. Yeah, it's all very good points. Um, I'm wondering if Matt wants to close this up today by just addressing our, our final audience, really. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, students and teachers here um, and schools in general, but Matt, what would you tell parents um, who may not be as well equipped to support virtual learning for a variety of different reasons? What would, what would be some final advice you would give to them about how they could support their students academically heading into the fall? So that's an interesting question. Um, I actually, the, the answer I give is probably not going to be satisfying to a lot of people. So. A parent asked me, my, my child, kid's getting all these uh, packets of stuff to work out with math, but I'm really, she's not very good at math. She's struggling with that. My response was, you're better off to take five minutes a day and practice your math facts. So I would encourage parents to think about um, what types of foundational skills can they support because the, the packets they're getting, the online learning they're doing is addressing some of those other needs. So come back and um, you know practice math facts, practice letter sounds. Um, practice letter names, have practice uh, rhyming with you with younger kids, you know, singing with them, have them rhyming with you and working on that. That's, those are all really great activities to work on. And even having a kid um, read to you uh, 
um, multiple times from a particular book or something, rereading a book over and over again. That's a really great thing to do as well. So think about um, what you think your kid, where your kid is, is low or needs the most support, and don't be afraid to, to address that, even if it's something different than what they're getting in the online instruction or in the packets. Okay. Um, I want to go then and just say that I, all of the comments that you all are offering really focus on the importance of planning and uh, being collaborative in our work as we head into the fall. And um, as we think about what our roles are over the summer months, I think probably this year more than any, uh, the importance of really getting ready for the fall uh, comes to mind. Um, and so let's take a moment though and just look at what some of our key messages are that we've heard today. First, I think it's really important to remember that there's no single point in time academic screening measure that will function accurately in the context of variability that we're currently seeing. There, there just isn't anything out there right now that we can rely on solely. Uh, so intervention trials in the classroom are going to be of critical importance um, and they must be part of our assessment process. Uh, secondly, uh, monitoring students' progress is going to be continue, continue to be an essential uh, in delivering appropriate instruction for all the kids, uh, especially in the learning, um, virtual learning environments that our kids are going to be working in. Thirdly, this COVID-19 extended break from schooling is exacerbating the achievement gap. Uh, we know that there is an inequity is going on and that there's students that are struggling uh, during this break and that this is going to have a significant impact on their academic performance when schools reopen and we need to keep in mind how this break uh, has affected people, that it's been different for all different types of kids and different groups of kids and that we need to really take the time to get to know the kids again and to understand where they are academically um, before we proceed with our own work. Um, uh, with them. And then lastly, the response to the extended break from instruction and intervention is going to require an immediate and systemic um, approach uh, before we return to normalcy. We need to really think about it. We need to be intentional in our work um, and conscious in our decision making and focus as best as we can on the evidence-based practices that we know work for kids. <coughs> In terms of what we have next coming up, um, as I mentioned at the onset of this broadcast, this webinar will be a little special in that we are launching a special series of member-only webinars as a follow-up to this one. These webinars will deconstruct the complexities of responding to student academic instruction and student progress measurement um, following the pandemic and by they will actually take into consideration the five general topics that we've talked about today. Screening, reading interventions, math interventions, writing interventions, and also special education evaluations and identification. <clears throat> we do plan to roll these special series out over the next month so that you can begin to use your summer months to begin your planning for next fall. Uh, we hope that those of you who are NAF members will benefit from this in-depth look at academics. <clears throat> And if you are not a NAS member, but you're interested in these webinars to come, well, we invite you to become a NAS member. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. <laughs> As with each webinar, we have also included direct links to the COVID-19 resource materials that we have posted on the NAS website. We do have a general uh, document called Considerations for Academic Assessments and Interventions Upon a Return to School that we've created especially for this webinar series. Um, and we have some additional uh, resources that we have looked at in previous webinars we think will be important to you. There are some references available to you also um, in this webinar and some external resources and we encourage you to look at those today. We want to thank all of you for listening to this webinar. We thank our experts for their time um, and the energy that they've put into this and the passion they've brought this topic. We look forward to hearing from all of you more in the subsequent webinars that are designed for our members. For all of you, we hope that you will stay safe and stay healthy, and we'll see you around in the next webinar.